Thank you for coming out on this cold evening. I am going to talk about confronting racism denial because in the United States, racism denial is like a huge black hole in our national landscape, much like black holes in the universe. You know, you've heard of black holes. They're, they're massive and they're powerful. If anything comes near, it gets sucked in, and they're invisible because even when light comes near, it gets sucked in. That is how racism denial is working in the US national landscape. And I'm here, I've been here for four and a half months in the UK, so it's too early for me to say, but maybe it's working that way in this country as well. So we need to confront racism denial, and I'm going to give you some tools for doing that. Um, Dr. Byrne, Professor Byrne, mentioned already that I was a president of the American Public Health Association six years ago in 2016, and I used that platform to the max to launch our association on a national campaign against racism with three tasks. The first, to name racism, because we must name a problem in order to even get started on the solution. But as necessary, as naming racism is, it's necessary but insufficient. We must move to action. And so the second of the three tasks is to ask, how is racism operating here in my child's daycare? How is racism operating here with regard to the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on minoritized communities in the UK, in the US, and in countries all over the world? How is racism operating here with regard to maternal mortality differences and the like? Because when we move to action, we need to do some landscaping to identify targets for intervention, levers for action. But then once we do that, the third task is to organize and strategize to act. And I say that not because we can't act as individuals. We certainly can act as individuals. We do have individual voices, so we can ask questions or challenge things. We can put things on agenda. We can put racism and anti-racism on all kinds of agendas. We can hire a student or whatever, but as much as we can act as individuals, collective action is real power. Because collective action informs us, it inspires us, it propels us, it protects us. So these three tasks that were part of my national campaign against racism are actually what now I'm understanding to be the task, the three steps of anti-racism as a process. More on that later. But even that first task of naming racism is so hard for many people. It's hard for people to say the word racism. I've observed that it might be a little bit harder here than it is in the UK. There's so much on race and whatever. But I haven't run into a lot of stuff that's racism and or anti-racism. So even for that first step, there are four key messages when we're naming racism. The first is that racism exists, confronting racism denial. The second is that racism is a system. We're not talking about an individual character flaw. The third is that racism saps the strength of the whole society. And the fourth is that, yes, we can act to dismantle racism. What I'm going to do this evening is share with you four allegories, four teaching stories, most of them based on something that happened in my own real life. But these are communication tools to help us understand and communicate to others these four key messages. So with regard to Racism Exist, I'm going to share with you my dual reality restaurant saga. With regard to Racism as a System, I'm going to share with you my cement dust in our lungs allegory. It's the newest one. You probably won't find it many places online. And you'll sort of feel that it might be the newest one. And you might, in our discussion afterward, help me actually deepen what I say there. The third one, with regard to racism, saps the strength of the whole society. I'll share with you my oldest allegory, my Gardner's Tale allegory, which was published 22 years ago. So that's a generation ago. And then the fourth uh, closing uh, allegory that I'll share with you is to say that, yes, we can act to dismantle racism and actually give you um, 
a sense of energy about that is life on a conveyor belt moving to action. So let's go. The first story, dual reality, a restaurant saga, as I said, is actually to help people understand that racism exists. Even people who have lived their whole lives thinking that they're living in the land of equal opportunity. This story, like many of my allegories, is based on something that happened in my own real life. So this story is based on an experience I had as a first year medical student. So now I want you to step into my shoes as I tell you that on this particular Saturday, first year medical student, I had awakened early. And because I'm a very diligent person, I was very studious. What did I do early in the morning that Saturday? I started studying, nose in the book, studying hard. Already it got to be mid-afternoon. I had hardly looked up and some friends of mine came over to my flat, to my apartment. And did they distract me from my studies? Well, no, they were medical students too. So we all got to studying long and hard. And now it's getting really late and we're getting hungry and I had no food in the apartment, which was so typical of me that my friends actually understood. They were like, okay, we got this, Kamara. You don't have any food in here, but we're hungry. So let's go into town and find something to eat. So we do. We walk into town, we find a restaurant, we walk in, we sit down, menus are presented, we order our food, and the food is served. Here we are eating. Not a very remarkable story, right? Most of us have experienced something like that. And not even the story that people in my generation in the United States would have expected if I was talking about racism in a restaurant. They may have thought that I was gonna say, we weren't served, but we were. So now you're like, oh, Dr. Jones, where are you going with this story? Okay, hold on. <laughs> As I sat there eating with my friends, I looked across the room and I noticed a sign that was a startling revelation to me about racism. So now I hope I've intrigued you and you're wondering, okay, Dr. Jones, please come on, what did the sign say? Well, what did the sign say? The sign said, open. So now maybe I've lost many of you. So let me recap. Here we are, sitting in a restaurant eating. I look across the room, I see a sign that says open. Thinking no more about it, I assume other hungry people can walk in, sit down, order their food and eat. But because I knew something about the two-sided nature of these signs, I actually realized that indeed the restaurant was now closed, due to the hour, but firmly closed. And that other hungry people, just a few feet away from me, but on the other side of that sign, would not be able to come in, sit down, order their food and eat. And that's when I realized that racism structures open, closed signs in our society. That racism structures, if you will, a dual reality. And for those who are sitting inside the restaurant at the table of opportunity eating, and they look up and they see a sign that says open. They don't even recognize that there's a two-sided sign going on because it is difficult for any of us to recognize a system of inequity that privileges us. So for example, it is difficult for men to recognize male privilege and sexism. It is difficult for white Americans and probably white Brits to recognize white privilege and racism. In fact, when I'm speaking to an American audience, I say it's difficult for all Americans to recognize our American privilege in the global context, even as we are living it so large right now with how much of the global supply of COVID-19 vaccine we are still sequestering in our country. Now, those on the outside are very well aware that there's a two-sided sign going on because it proclaims closed to them, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. So back inside the restaurant, to those who ask, is there really a two-sided sign? Does racism really exist? I say, I know it's hard for you to know when you only see open. In fact, that's part of your privilege, not to have to know. But once you do know, you can choose to act. So it's not a scary thing to name racism. It's actually an empowering thing to name racism. It doesn't even compel you to act, but it does equip you to act so that if you care about those on the other side of the sign, which is an if, but if you do, why, why you could even talk to the restaurant owner who is, after all, inside with you. And you could say, restaurant owner, 
There are hungry people outside. Why don't you open the door and let them come in? You'll make more money. And oh, the conversations we could have. Or maybe what you'll do is pass food through the window, or maybe you'll try to tear down the sign or break through the door. But at least what you won't be doing is sitting back saying, huh, wonder why those people don't just come on in and sit down and eat. Because you'll understand something about the two-sided nature of that sign that proclaims open to you. So when I have five or six minutes to share with an audience what I hope is a memorable image, I'm actually hoping I'm going to share with you four allegories today. My charge to you is to remember at least one of them well enough to share them with somebody else tonight, somebody in your family, a neighbor, a co-worker tomorrow if you must. Okay. But when I have five or six minutes to share with people an image that helps them understand that, yes, racism exists, it is structuring a two-sided or multi-sided sign, creating a dual or multifaceted reality, this is the story that I tell. It helps us understand if we don't already know and communicate if we do already know, you know, to others. I have, on two separate occasions, sparked what each time was a three-hour conversation by raising this following very simple question. How could people who were born inside the restaurant know something about the two-sided nature of that sign? And both times it was a three-hour conversation because there are many ways to know. I am actually heartened that more people who were born inside the restaurant and who just two and a half years ago might have been sitting aside eating and saying, what are those people outside saying? Black lives matter? Don't they know all lives matter? More of those people are now actually affirming, yes, black lives matter. More people who were born inside the restaurant are saying the word racism, putting together the phrases, you know, structural racism, systemic racism. This is important. It's heartening. But here is my warning. If we just say a thing, put something on our institutional websites, you know, tweet something out, Instagram, whatever you're using. If we just say a thing, six months from today, we may forget why we said that thing because racism denial is so staunchly held by so many and it's so seductive that we may fall into what I describe as the sleepiness, oh, the, the somnolence of racism denial. So we must go beyond naming racism to action. We need to tear down the sign. And of course, racism is not just a sign. It's the sign. It's the door. It's the lock. There's a whole system going on. We need to dismantle the lock, take the door off the hinges, because once we start acting, we will not forget why we are acting. So that is my first story, Dual Reality, A Restaurant Saga. I am actually going to make references to it twice more during this talk. But for right now, I know I owe you a definition, don't I? I owe you a definition of racism. Because all of us, I've said the word about a gazillion times, but we might have different things that we're thinking of. So this is how I define racism. First of all, when I say the word, I'm clear that I'm talking about a system. I am not talking about an individual character flaw or a personal moral failing or even a psychiatric illness, as some people have suggested. Although, yes, racism can manifest in all of those ways and more. But in its essence, racism is a system of power and a system of doing what? A system of doing two things, of structuring opportunity and of assigning value. And on what basis is the opportunity structured and on what basis is the value assigned? It's based on so-called race, based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race in a race-conscious society. I'll just step a little bit away from my definition for a minute to say that in the United States, in all parts of the United States, if you look at me, I am clearly black. In some parts of Brazil, you look at me, I am just as clearly white. In South Africa, you look at me, I am just as clearly colored. Here in the UK, I understand I am mixed, right? Now, some, some people say, well, maybe, maybe not. Okay, so I don't know. I've been here four and a half months. I'm trying to figure it out, right? But the thing is, here I am, same physical appearance, but in these different settings, my physical appearance, the social interpretation of my physical appearance would assign me to different racial groups and furthermore, if I were to stay in any of those settings long enough, 
then my health outcomes, educational outcomes, other outcomes would become that of the group to which I've been assigned, even though I'd have the same genes, for example, and culture and all that in all of these places. That's true not just for me, you know, relatively light-skinned black woman. For every single person within the sound of my voice, there is some other place on this earth where your so-called race would be quite different from how you are living it today. Right. So that's, I, I didn't expect to spend so long on that, but, but race, we just have to be clear, race is not biology, it's not written in our genes, it's not culture, it's not social class. We're going to talk about why we see, you know, a disproportionate number of people of color in the U.S. and probably in the U.K., you know, overrepresented in poverty while white people are overrepresented in wealth. So we're going to talk about all of that. But what, what race is, is the street race, the social interpretation of somebody without somebody saying, excuse me, how do you self-identify? Excuse me, where were you born? Where were your parents born? Oh, excuse me, may I have a little aliquot of your blood? I have an interesting genetic hypothesis. No, that street race is the race, the substrate on which racism operates day to day. Now, what are the impacts of racism? Well, when people do recognize that racism exists, then they get to the point that, yes, racism is unfairly disadvantaging some individuals and communities. But it shouldn't take any of us long to recognize that every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage, so that racism is also unfairly advantaging other individuals and communities. That's the whole issue of unearned white privilege that we hardly ever talk about in the US. I don't know if you talk about it here. Um, because it makes some people, especially some people who are living as white, uncomfortable. I used to, when I would, get to this part of my definitions and talks in the before COVID times, and I would see people who are living as white kind of scrunching around in their seats. I used to almost apologize, right, that for the discomfort that I was causing them. I would say, oh, I'm not trying to make anybody uncomfortable. If you feel uncomfortable, I just want you to shake it off. Stay with me. I'm going to tell you more stories. I do not apologize anymore. What I say is if you feel uncomfortable acknowledging or even entertaining the possibility of unearned white privilege, I want you to lean into that discomfort. And how do you lean in? You lean in by reading more, reading history, talking to strangers, going across town, you know, and experiencing other people's realities. Why do I say lean into that discomfort? Because I have come to recognize that for all of us, the edge of our comfort is actually our growing edge. But there's a third impact of racism that many of us miss. And that is that racism saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. So when we don't vigorously invest in the full, excellent public education of all of our kids, because the blinders in the US, the blinders of racism make people feel like there's no genius in the barrios, the ghettos, on the reservations. We can get along very well, thank you, without those kids. When, of course, there's genius in all of our communities, and if we were to only vigorously invest in that genius, we could be doing so much better as a nation and as a world. In the U.S., that same, those same blinders that don't value all of us make us complacent with what I describe as the wholesale warehousing disproportionately of so many black and brown men in our prison system as if that didn't separate us from human potential. I could spend 10 minutes on that point about how racism saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. I will just say that I actually think that that is the impact of racism that we need to elevate most urgently these days. We need more conversation about that in our media, right? We need more data collection. Here's my challenge to those of you all who are dating data collection that can ask that question and then share with us the findings. We need more conversations around our faculty tables, around our boardroom tables, around our dining room tables, so that more people feel a sense of urgency to dismantle this system and put in its place a system in which all people can know and develop to their full potential. So, Shifting gears just a moment, there are a lot of people in my country and in the world who value comfort. 
And there are a lot of people in my country and in the world who value social justice. And in the current status quo, valuing comfort and valuing social justice are almost like polar opposite ends of a value system, right? I'm not saying you can't be comfortable and value social justice, but if you value comfort, if that's your, the thing that you are trying to optimize, unless you are expanding the we who needs to be uncomfortable to include all of us, you are not <laughs> valuing social justice, right? In fact, those people who value comfort are very much like those who were born inside the restaurant, sitting at the table of opportunity, eating. They value comfort because they are made comfortable by the status quo. They are benefited by the status quo. They don't even wonder why no one else is coming inside the restaurant. They may not even notice that because they are so consumed with their meal and the conversation around their table. They certainly do not want to examine the sign to see as they heard rumor that it might stay closed on the other side. In fact, in the United States, they are passing laws state by state across our nation, anti-critical race theory laws to prevent teaching in, case, in our you know, primary and secondary school and even in some universities about racism, anti-racism, health equity, social justice, history, because it would make their children uncomfortable to examine, to see whether there's really a two-sided sign going on. They certainly don't care to know what the outsiders are saying. They're not craning. What are they, those people saying outside? And they really don't think that an outsider would add anything to their conversation. They have been told, perhaps, that they need to diversify their table. But they think, oh, OK, we'll do that. It might make a more politically correct picture. They do not expect that an outsider is bringing genius to the table. They do not think, they don't understand they're bringing you know, insight and different perspectives. They also don't wonder how the food that they're eating got to them. They don't recognize that those people outside the restaurant are the same ones who grew the food, transported the food back to the kitchen, cook the food, serving them, and cannot come and sit inside the restaurant. And certainly these people who value comfort do not want to budge from their seats at the table. They very jealously guard their privilege, their comfort. Now those who value social justice, value social justice for two reasons. The first is that they know that there's a two-sided sign going on. Many of them know that because they were born outside the restaurant and they have seen the closed sign, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. But they also know that the operation of that two-sided sign saps the strength of the whole society. I am in no way suggesting that the circumstances of our birth completely define our values, right? And I recognize that there are people who have been born inside the restaurant who wonder why aren't other people coming in, who ask what are those people saying outside, and then they go outside and they burst through their bubble of experience to experience our common humanity on the other side of that sign in very different circumstances. And there are those people who were born outside the restaurant who, through lots of degrees and lots of proving themselves and sometimes even promising never to mention the two-sided nature of the sign, get inside the restaurant. When they get inside, and that's a heavy promise to make, right? to promise that they never saw that it said closed on the other side. Sometimes they are placed very near the window so that other people outside can see them. And sometimes they use that position near the window to also stick their foot in the door to keep it ajar to help other people come in. Sometimes they use that position near the window and door to actually be some of the staunchest gatekeepers. We don't have time to go into it. We had just about an hour ago, very vigorous discussion about a lot on here. And so there's a lot to go into on that. But what I want to leave you with right now as I leave this image is that part of what we need to do is to move more people from valuing comfort to valuing social justice, even as we recognize that valuing, com um, valuing social justice in the current status quo will not always and maybe not ever be comfortable. And as I hope, I hope to reserve maybe half an hour for discussion and questions and answers. So as I share these ideas and I'll jot down if you have questions because I would love to have a very vigorous conversation. 
I am going to shift gears now to the second of my four stories. This one, um, I'm giving you the preamble to the Gardner's Tale allegory, where I describe three levels of racism. As I said, I published this story 22 years ago. At that time, I described these three levels as institutionalized, which we would now describe as structural racism, personally mediated, which some people describe as interpersonal racism, but I am so clear that racism is a system that even though personally mediated is a tongue twister, I call it that because this is the system mediated through people and then internalized racism. So I am going to first define each of these levels of racism for you, give you examples of how they can impact health because I am actually a family physician and an epidemiologist, but also if you're working in the criminal legal system, if you're working in housing or education, you will recognize how they impact all of those other sectors as well. And then I'm going to illustrate the relationship between those three levels of racism with my Gardner's Tale allegory, trying to understand what do we need to do to set things right. So institutionalized or structural racism, that is the system, right? That is the constellation of structures, policies, practices, norms, and values which taken together result in differential access to the goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. And you'll notice that all of my definitions are something differential by race. And you'll also notice that I put race in quotes, and when I say the word, I use air quotes because I am so clear that we're not talking about what many people think of when they hear race and they immediately jump to biology. Okay. This system does not require an identifiable perpetrator and often shows up as inherited disadvantage or its reciprocal inherited advantage. We see it in terms of you know, material conditions and in terms of differential access to power. So examples include differential access to quality housing, excellent educational opportunities, equal employment opportunities, even the same level of income at the same level of employment, and clearly by race, and clearly those things impact health. It shows up as differential access to medical facilities in the US, because we don't even have a national health service. We don't have a national health system. We don't have national anything. We have lots of different systems with lots of holes in between. But even here, with the National Health Service, many people are opting out you know, um, into the private system. I understand that the NHS is, uses some of its money even to pay private things. I'm trying to learn about all of that. But in the US especially, differential access to medical facilities by race, including differential physical access, differential uh, financial access, differential linguistic access in terms of Translation in that. Differential access to a clean environment. And the very well documented in the United States disproportionate placement of toxic dump sites, bus transfer stations and the like in communities of color. Our Environmental Protection Agency has a term, sacrifice zones, which describes communities in close pro proximity to known polluting industries. There should not be such a a, a description, there should be no communities in close proximity to known polluting industries, but those sacrifice zones are disproportionately communities of color. And then in terms of access to power, differential access to power as information, which could be health information or even information about our own histories, differential access to power as resources, not just capital resources, but social networking resources, knowing somebody on the board, and differential access to power as voice in media, in government, and the like. Now, sometimes people stop me here, and they say, Dr. Jones, look at that top set of examples, housing, education, employment, income. Dr. Jones, isn't that what we call social class? Why do you have that on a slide about racism? Are you talking about racism or are you really, really talking about social class? That is a very important question because some of you might have that question in your hearts here, especially because at least you recognize social class more in this country than we do in the US. So I need to answer that question, don't I, for you? And my answer starts with the observation that it doesn't just so happen that people of color 
minoritized, as, you know, minoritized individuals, that people of color are overrepresented in poverty in my country, while white people are overrepresented in wealth, that is not just a happenstance. And for each marginalized, stigmatized, oppressed group of color, there has been some initial historical injustice. So for example, for indigenous North Americans, the initial historical injustice was the taking of the land, the near genocide, and the moving of survivors to reserve lands, reservations, and in some instances, something good was found under one reservation. Oops, you gotta pick the people up and move them someplace else. There are many families that lived in Mexico for centuries, never crossed the border, but the border crossed them. They find themselves in New Mexico and they are targeted and demeaned and the like, with, like the, in Texas, the El Paso massacre and the like. There are Chinese laborers who were brought to the US to help build our transcontinental, ooh, transcontinental railway. And, um, but in the 1880s, the, with the Chinese uh, Exclusion Act, unable by law to bring their families to join them, unable by law to marry. There are Japanese Americans in the United States who during World War II were interned in prison camps while German Americans and Italian Americans were not treated that way. And for people of African descent, the initial historical injustice was the kidnapping of West African people, our importation across the Atlantic with tremendous loss of life in the Middle Passage, and then for the survivors and their progeny for generations and generations, what I describe as the coerced usury of our unpaid labor to build that country. And when people in the United States hear me talking like that, they go, oh, there you go talking about slavery. Dr. Jones, don't you recognize that the enslaved people were emancipated by 1865? Here we are in 2022. Ooh, that was some water, but it's all right. It's not on any electronics. Don't you realize that the um, enslaved people were emancipated by, you know, in 1865, we're in 2022, which makes that 157 years ago, all else being equal, Dr. Jones, don't you think the impacts of slavery would have washed out by now? Well, the answer is in the question, isn't it? All else being equal. All else has not been equal since 1865, and all else still is not equal today, and there are present-day contemporary structural factors that are perpetuating that and all these other initial historical injustices that I've described in the U.S. context, and I need to learn more about British history. I'd be loved for you guys to tell me in this context. What I have understood is that we are ahistorical as a nation in the U.S., perhaps also in the U.K. We do not understand that Racism is foundational in our country's history and in this country's wealth, right? Anyway, so all I'm saying is that when people ask, are you talking about social class or are you talking about racism? Structural racism, institutionalized racism explains why we even see an association between social class and race. This is a very important aha. It does not just so happen. Now, structural racism also, I need to say, can be through acts of doing as well as acts of not doing, acts of commission as well as acts of omission, and very often structural racism shows up as lack of action, inaction, in the face of need. The second level of racism that I'll describe, personally mediated racism, I define as differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others by race, and then differential actions based on those assumptions. This is what most people think of when they hear the word racism. Somebody did something to somebody. It includes the different idea, the prejudice, and the different action, the discrimination. And there are many ways that it manifests in my country and in yours, police brutality, you know, uh, Stefan Clark's cell phone when he's in his grandmother's backyard interpreted as a gun and he's shot. You know, over and over again, unarmed black men in the U.S. shot. Um, I'm not gonna stay long on all of these because I, I, I can talk a lot. But anyway, a physician disrespect, which can be as subtle as a physician not giving a patient the full range of treatment options because the physician figures that patient couldn't afford, wouldn't understand, wouldn't comply anyway, whatever they assume 
or it could be as blatant as sterilization abuse, which has had many iterations in my country's history. You have shopkeeper vigilance being followed around in stores. I don't know if that happens here yet because I haven't been shopping too, too much. Waiter indifference, not getting quick respectful treatment. And both of those are examples of what some people call everyday racism. You know, they call them microaggressions, although it doesn't feel so micro to those who are aggressed. But the subtle communication of disrespect, which might actually result in elevated blood pressures in communities of color, blood pressures that don't even go down at night. And then teacher devaluation. This is a very important manifestation of personally mediated racism, because if a teacher looks at a young child and thinks, that child can't learn, and puts them off in the attention deficit disorder track inappropriately, that child will never even know their full potential, much less have the opportunity to develop to their full potential. So like structural or institutionalized racism, personally mediated racism occurs through acts of doing, acts of commission as well as acts of not doing, acts of omission. But even more important to recognize at this level is that personally mediated racism can be unintentional as well as intentional. You do not have to have intended to do something racist to have had a racist impact. The third level of racism, internalized racism, I define also as something differential by race. So for members of structurally disadvantaged races, it shows up as acceptance of negative messages about our own abilities and intrinsic worth. But for members of structurally advantaged races, it shows up as a sense of entitlement, where that sense of entitlement actually then requires racism denial. Because if you feel like you are entitled to what you have, then there can be no unfair system going on. In terms of health outcomes, I'm going to focus on those for people from structurally disadvantaged, marginalized, oppressed, stigmatized races, where this level of racism shows up as self-devaluation, feeling maybe I'm really not as good as. Maybe I shouldn't try to graduate from high school or secondary school. Maybe, you, maybe I shouldn't try to apply to that university or live in that neighborhood or try to get that job. It turns into what my parents' generation called the white man's ice is colder syndrome. I don't know if you've ever heard that terminology. What it meant in my parents' generation for people of color, it still means for many of us in my generation today. So say I'm black and I need a lawyer, I might actually seek out a white lawyer over a black lawyer. Or if I were sick, I might prefer the white doctor over the black doctor if I could find a black doctor. Or if my lemonade were warm, I might go way down the street to get the white man's ice over the black man's ice, deeply believing that the white man's ice is colder, deeply internalizing the myth of white superiority. And this level of racism also shows up as resignation, helplessness, hopelessness, which turns into a lot of self-destructive health behaviors. And it's really about members of stigmatized races accepting the limitations to our own full humanity of the box into which we've been placed. Now, I do not have the health impacts for members of structurally advantaged races because for the longest time I've been trying to figure out how could a feeling of entitlement turn into bad health outcomes. Although I will say that if you have a sense of entitlement thwarted, then maybe that does turn into some of what people in the US are describing as the diseases of despair in white populations, the suicides, the second opioid epidemic, and the like. So anyway, now I'm going to shift to my gardener's tale. This story, and so now there's not going to be anything up there except that. So you can really focus on me for a while, because I'm going to tell the story. This story, like uh, most of my early allegories, is based on something that happened in my own real life. So now let me tell you what I saw with my own eyes. Then we're going to make it a story about racism to illustrate those three levels and the like. My husband and I had been married about a year when we moved down to Baltimore so I could finish my PhD at Hop Johns Hopkins, and we bought our first freestanding house, cute little house with a big wraparound porch with flower boxes dotted all on the porch. And it was October when we bought that house, not really the time to plant in Baltimore, Maryland, so we waited. But when spring came, my husband, who loves to garden, ran out with our marigolds. He's going to decorate our cute little house. But he soon came right back in, and he said, Kamara, some of these boxes have dirt in them, but some of these boxes are empty. So I need to go down to the gardening store. 
So he does. He goes down to the gardening store. He comes back hauling big old bags of potting soil, right? And so then we fill up those empty boxes with that potting soil. And then we take equal numbers of our marigold seeds and put them in all of the boxes. And then we water all of the boxes equally. And by this time, I am not the gardener in the family. By this time, I'm exhausted. So I just figure I'm going to sit back and be delighted. Three weeks later, as I'm walking out of my front door onto my por porch, I finally pay attention to these flower boxes. And what I saw made me literally stop in my tracks because what I saw made me think we had planted completely different species in some boxes versus others, because some of the boxes were full of plants and they were tall, vigorous looking plants, and some of the boxes just had a few plants in them and they were kind of scrawny and scraggly. And then I realized what had happened. That potting soil that my husband had bought turned out to be rich, fertile soil so that every single seed planted in the rich, fertile soil had sprouted. The strong seed had grown very tall and vigorous, but even the weak seed had made it halfway up. But that old soil that we had found there turned out to be poor, rocky soil. So the weak seed planted in the poor, rocky soil just died. And even the strong seed in the poor, rocky soil had to struggle to make it to a middling height. And some of you guys are nodding, so there are some gardeners in this room, and maybe you've seen this image with your own real eyes. You know, maybe you've composted half of your garden and the like, and you know that this image is about the importance of the soil, the importance of the environment. But now I'm going to take this image and I'm going to make it a story about racism by introducing a gardener. So now we have a gardener who has two flower boxes, one which she knows to have rich, fertile soil, one which she knows to have poor, rocky soil, and she has seed for the same kind of flowers, Except some of the seed is going to produce pink blossoms and some of the seed is going to produce red blossoms and the gardener prefers red over pink. So what does she do? She takes the red seed, puts it in the rich fertile soil, pink seed in the poor rocky soil. Three weeks later in her garden, she sees what I saw in mine. In, in the rich fertile soil, all the red seed sprouts, strong red seed, tall and vigorous, even the weak red seed makes it halfway up. In the poor rocky soil, the weak pink seed dies. Here comes the strong pink seed struggling to make it to a middling height. And then in those two flower boxes, those flowers go to seed. And the next year, same thing happens. And then those flowers go to seed. And year after year after year after year, the same thing happens until finally, oh, about 10 years later, the gardener's looking at her flower boxes and she says, you know, I was actually right to prefer red over pink. So we interrupt the story there to say the first part of this story is how structural or institutionalized racism works, where you have the initial historical injustice of the separation of the seed into the two types of soil. You have the contemporary structural factors of the flower boxes keeping the soil separate, and then through lack of action, inaction in the face of need, perpetuation of the inequity. But let me pick the story back up to say, well, where would personally mediated racism be in this garden? Well, the gardener's looking at the flowers, she looks at the red flower, she says, oh, the red flowers are so beautiful. And then she looks at the pink flowers and she says, oh, they sure are scrawny and scraggly. So she plucks off the pink blossoms before they can even go to seed. Or she may notice that a pink seed has blown into the rich fertile soil, so she plucks it out before it can establish itself, which is some of the anti-affirmative action stuff that goes on in our country. And where would internalized racism be in the garden? Well, the red flowers are just living their lives, enjoying being red, many of them not acknowledging or perhaps not even understanding that they're benefiting from enriched soil. The pink flowers are looking over at red, thinking red is mighty fine and wishing with all their hearts that they too could be red. And here come the bees, minding their own business, collecting nectar, pollinating at the same time. So here comes a bee bzz, over into one of the pink flowers, and then bzz, to another pink flower, and bzz, to this pink flower. And this flower's like, get away from me, bee. Don't bring me any of that pink pollen. I prefer the red. Because the pink flower has internalized that red is better than pink. So now the question arises, what do we do to set things right in this garden? Well, we could start by addressing the internalized racism. So we can go over to the pink flowers, and we can say, pink is beautiful, power to the pink. And that is a very important intervention. But if that is all that we do, it's not going to change the situation in which the pink flowers find themselves. So then you say, OK, OK, we got that. Let's address the personally mediated racism. Let's have a conversation with the gardener, or better yet, 
in the U.S., let's have a workplace multicultural workshop for the gardener. And it's all good. And we have our workshop. And in the workshop, we say, dear gardener, would you please stop plucking those pink flowers? And maybe she will, and maybe she won't. But even if she does, it's still not going to change the situation in which those pink flowers find themselves. What we really need to do if we want to set things right in the garden is address the structural racism, which means we need to break down the boxes and mix up the soil. Or if you really need to keep separate boxes for whatever reason, which is not such a good idea if you have that same gardener because it makes it easier for that same gardener to continue segregating resources going forward. But if you decide you need to keep those same boxes, then it means you must enrich that poor rocky soil until it is as rich as the rich fertile soil. And when you do that, the pink flowers will flourish. They'll be looking beautiful, grand, and glorious. And I'm going to say a thing that I used to say all the time in the US, and then I stopped, but I'm going to say it here. Because that pink seed has been selected for survival and strength, those pink flowers might even look a little better. Like I, I, I used to always say it, and then I realized that's some red flowers or red gardener's biggest fear. But anyway, it's the truth, right? So no, so let's say the flowers are looking equally beautiful, okay? So now that the flowers are looking equally beautiful because you've enriched the poor rocky soil, you will have also addressed the internalized racism because the pink flowers will no longer be looking over at red, thinking red is better, or wanting to be red. And in that intervention, you may also address the structural racism. Now, the original gardener may have to go to her grave. I mean, the personal immediate. I'm sorry, we did the structural, internalized. You may also address the personal immediate racism. Now, the original gardener may have to go to her grave, preferring red over pink. But her children, who grow up and see the flowers equally beautiful, would be less likely to adopt that kind of attitude. So this story has been to illustrate the different levels of racism, strongly suggests that if we want to set things right in the garden, we need to at, less at least address the structural racism. Good to address all the levels at the same time, but at least address the structural racism, and when we do, the other levels may take care of themselves. But there's one more question I haven't asked yet, which is, who is the gardener? After all, the gardener is the one that I gave the power to decide, the power to act, control of resources, which are actually the elements of self-determination. In the U.S., you know, government is a huge part of the gardener, but not the only part. Media, foundations, corporations, communities, to the extent that they have self-determination. But whoever the gardener is, it is dangerous when the gardener is allied with one group. I painted her red, which is why she prefers red over pink. And it's also dangerous when the gardener is not concerned with equity. When she looks at her flower boxes and she thinks that her garden is beautiful, thank you, because she's not even counting the pink flowers as part of her garden. So now the question arises, what do we do to, about the gardener? Do we need to make the gardener striped, polka dotted, fuchsia? Do the pink flowers need to grow or recruit their own gardener? Many questions that you know, can come out of this story, and I hope I leave some time for us to deal with that too, but I want to share with you two questions that I now share forward every time I tell this story. The first was asked of me about 15 years ago, and it was like in the audience, Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones. So yes, Dr. Jones, why should the red flowers share their soil? When I heard that question, I loved that question because it showed me the power of this story to start conversations about racism, which might be otherwise difficult if we were talking about racism between you and me. My answer to that question, why should the red flowers share their soil, is that actually that soil does not belong to the red flowers. It belongs to the whole garden. Here's a second question. What if that's not the original gardener that we're looking at? What if that's the gardener's great, 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 great grandchild? Here we are. And the great, 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 great grandchild has always seen the flowers looking like that, may not even think that there is a problem to be solved. So I think there are three things that we need to do there. First, we must make the differences in the height and vigor of the pink and red flowers a problem requiring urgent solution. We need to put that on our urgent action agenda. But now that it's on the agenda, oh my god, what are we going to do? So step two is we must make the flower boxes transparent. We must be talking about the differences in the quality of the soil so that we can address the differences in the quality of the soil. And step three is as we make those flower boxes transparent, we must also make sure that everybody knows that the pink seed did not just go launch themselves into that poor rocky soil. So we must talk about history, and we must talk about how the gardener's initial preference for red over pink 
which some people might describe as cultural racism, you know, um, white supremacist ideology, or whatever, in, in the US context, we must talk about that because if we do not, even if we're able to compel, not only talk about it, but address it, right? Even if we're able to compel that red gardener today to enrich the poor rocky soil today until it, as it is as rich as the rich fertile soil today, if she continues to prefer red over pink, she will continue to privilege red over pink going forward. So when I defined racism as a system of doing two things, structuring opportunity and assigning value, for many years, my gardener's tale was just about the opportunity structure piece of it, the differences in the quality of the soil, the boxes and all, until I came to recognize we must address both aspects if we're going to set things right in our garden. So that was the longest story. We're not gonna whiz through the last two stories now. And please tell me, what is the time? It's six now, okay. So we're gonna really whiz through them, but um, I hope that you're expecting to stay through 6.30, so hopefully we'll have 15 minutes where we can talk, okay. This third story, cement dust in our lungs, I used to help people understand that we need to understand racism as a system. When I say cement dust in this story, I want you to think cement dust, and I want you to think racism. So imagine that there's a cement factory spewing cement dust, and the cement dust fills the air. And if any of us are anywhere around this factory for any amount of time, we will develop cement dust in our lungs. And the cement dust in our lungs is problematic for all of us, even though it might affect different ones of us differently. So the cement dust in my lungs might make me feel that I'm less than, kind of internalized right, racism. Whereas the, the cement dust in somebody else's lungs might make him feel that he can, with equanimity, crush the life out of another human being with his knee for nine minutes and 29 seconds. But however it's affecting us, the cement dust in our lungs is hurting all of us, even those people who do not recognize or will not admit that they have cement dust in their lungs. So the question is, what do we do about this? So do we focus on the individual? Well, what would that look like? So I'm gonna just share with you two interventions. Maybe we decide we're gonna have some kind of machine that screens for how much cement dust you have in your lungs. And then if you have too much dust, eh, 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 some kind of alarm goes off. Well, first of all, how much is too much? dust, right? And what are you going to do with those people? Put them on the edge of society, vote them off the island? You know, I don't know what we can do. But also, that kind of strategy, although it's very useful to help people understand, those especially who don't think they have any cement dust in their lungs, to help them understand that they do have cement dust in their lungs, but it interferes with talking about cement dust, because if this is the strategy People don't want to hear cement dust. They think that, well, I'll say it in terms of racism. If you say the word racism, they think you're trying to peer deeply into their souls to see exactly how racist are you, right? So that's the limitation of that strategy. But let's say that there are people who know they have cement dust in their lungs and they want it out. So we could set up cleansing spas and people, you know, trainings, right? And, and people could... Um, go in, volunteer, or be encouraged to go in. And they go in and they start reading and reading history and talking to strangers and going across town and staying a while, and they come back out good as new. But if they come into that same cloud of dust, the dust is just going to reaccumulate in their lungs because it's not a very permanent solution unless they stay living in the cleansing spa. But actually now we might have a little insight about what else we could do. Maybe what we need to do is acknowledge the cloud, right? So what would that look like? Well, if we acknowledge the cloud, at least I would know that I wasn't born with cement dust in my lungs, right? And it also gives me the idea, if I want to prevent more cement dust coming in my lungs, I could actually put on a gas mask, start my individual anti-cement dust journey, recognizing that I need to keep this gas mask, so the gas mask is reading, reading history, all of these things, right? That the individual, um, Gas mask, I need to keep it on 24 seven because if I just take it off for a minute, oh, more dust is gonna get in my lungs. I also need to recognize that the gas mask in and of itself is not going to extract the dust from my lungs that was already there. So we need to do some combination cleansing spa or whatever. But here's the thing, I am encouraged now wearing this gas mask, doing my individual anti-cement dust journey 24 seven, I'm encouraged when I see myself reflected in a window, shop window, or in a mirror that I have my gas mask on, and you guys are curious. You're like, Dr. Jones, why are you wearing a gas mask? To which I answer, well, 
you know, there's this big cloud of cement dust that we're living in. So I can start naming racism in that way. You know, do you want to keep breathing it in? And so more and more of you might say, oh, no, I want to put on a gas mask too. So more and more of us can start putting on gas masks, starting our individual anti-cement dust journeys. So is that the answer then? In the United States, does it mean that we just need 330 million gas masks, baby gas masks, old people gas masks? Well, it's a start, but I think really what we need to do is dismantle the factory. So especially those of us who have started our individual anti-cement dust journeys, we need to move into action, right? Get closer to that factory, which has been obscured so much by all the dust it threw up that some people don't even know there's a factory in there, right? And then as we get closer, we need to ask, how is this factory operating here? Looking at structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. And then we need to organize and strategize to act to dismantle this factory and put in its place a system in which all people can know and develop to their full potentials. So not only is this story to illustrate that racism is a system and that we must address racism at the systems level. I mean, really, that's the thing that we can address this problem of cement dust in our lungs at many levels, but we must address it at the systems level if we really want to set things right. Now, I mentioned the question, how is the cement factory operating here, which is how is racism operating here? That's an important question to ask because racism is not a miasma or a cloud that we can't get a handle on. It is a system with identifiable and addressable mechanisms, addressable mechanisms that are in our structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. And now, as you look at that list, I may have given some of you a headache. You're like, what am I supposed to do with that? Structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. It feels like that until we recognize that all of these are actually the elements of decision making, where structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision making, especially who's at the table and who's not, what's on the agenda and what's not. And if you find yourself, each of us, when we find ourselves at a decision-making table, I charge you henceforth, your first job should be to look around and say, who is not here who has an interest in this proceeding? And then your job in the short term might be to represent their interests, but really your job in the long term is to create space, to find them a way to the table. And if structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision-making, policies are the written how of decision-making, and when people try to analyze stuff about racism, they usually go to policies because that's the easiest thing. You can read something, right? That's a good practice, but also we need to develop, again, the, the sensitivity to the absence of what policies are not in place that if put in place could bring about more social justice. And if policies are the written how of decision making, then both practices and norms are the unwritten how of decision making, harder to get a handle on. Practices are just kind of how we do things today. Just watch me, you'll learn. Norms are more deeply embedded over time, how we've always done things and how we expect you to do things going forward. And values, values are the why. And so if we take this question, how is racism operating here with us everywhere? I have done it when I'm going to speak to a new audience on you know, children of color and exposure to nature or whatever. I think, how is racism operating here? If you just spend 10 minutes with this question, you can generate 5, 10, 15, different levers of intervention that could be useful first starts for anti-racism work. So I'm going to go back again to the dual reality image to say, what can we do today where we need to look for evidence of two-sided signs actively? We need to ask, is there something differential going on here by race, by postcode, by language, by immigration status, by religion, whatever, looking not only at outcome, but also at opportunity structures. We need to burst through our bubbles of experience to experience our common humanity on the other side of town. What do I mean by our bubbles of experience? Well, all of us live in a bubble of experience. Some of our bubbles are vast with thin soap bubble boundaries. Some of our bubbles are smaller with thicker plexiglass boundaries. Some of our bubbles have been tinted. Some of our bubbles are polarized. In my country, some of our bubbles have been hardened by fear. But whatever kind of bubble we live in, most of us do not really know that just across town, there are people who are just as kind, funny, generous, hardworking, smart as we are, who are living in very different circumstances. So we need to create 
at the individual and institutional level, bubble bursting opportunities so we can experience our common humanity in different settings and start building common cause. We need to be interested in the stories of others and then believe the stories of others without requiring cell phone video documentation or body cam footage in my country. And then we need to join in the stories of others. We need to develop a sensitivity to the absence of, this is very important, who's not at the table, what's not on the agenda, what policies are not in place that if put in place would be quite productive. We need to reveal inaction, lack of action in the face of need. But what we also need to recognize is that all the power is not just among those who are inside the restaurant. Those of us who are outside the restaurant need to know our power, to recognize that action is power, and especially that collective action is power. But now you think I can't count, because I said I was going to give you four allegories. This sounds like the end of a talk. Often I end my talks here, but no. So this story is sparked by an image from the book why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria and other conversations about race by Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum? In her book, in which she is talking to white people about you don't have to try to be racist to be participating and benefiting from racism, she describes racism for them as living life on a conveyor belt. They're just going to work raising the kids, but they're on a conveyor belt moving inexorably through and toward racism. I want to take her image and expand on that image to talk about how we become actively anti-racism. So here we are on this conveyor belt. Uh, some of us are actually being chewed up by the conveyor belt, <laughs> making a run, but there are some who are on top of the conveyor belt, and so they're you know, moving through racism, going to work, whatever, um, just so involved. Not only on the conveyor belt moving through racism, but there's actually a big sign up there that's saying racism, racism, racism. But people are so involved in their lives that they don't even look up, or maybe they look up and they go, oh, racism, and then they close their eyes. So they're you know, in racism denial and they keep on going. Or maybe they look up and they go, oh, racism, and then they turn around, but they don't do anything else. So maybe they're colorblind and they're still swept along on this conveyor belt. So now what do I want us to do, right? Well, here we are in this conveyor belt, living our lives, we see racism, whoops. We got to turn around, yes, but then we need to take a step, right? And another step, and we need to start walking at least as fast as the conveyor belt is moving just to stay in the same place, right? And let me ask you this, what happens when you are move, walking backwards on a crowded conveyor belt? Oop, you start bumping into people, and they're like, hey, buddy, watch out, where are you going? What are you doing? Which is your opportunity to do the first of the three tasks of being actively anti-racism, which is to name racism, to say, well, do you see where we're going? Do you want to go there, or will you turn with me? Most people do not want to be disturbed from their comfort. So they'll just say, well, get out of my way. But maybe one or two will turn. So now you have two or three of you walking backwards on this crowded conveyor belt. You keep bumping into people. You keep naming racism. You keep inviting people to turn with you. And more and more will join you. Never 50%. Don't hold your heart out for 50%. But now you're developing a critical mass. So what does that mean? Not only does that mean, uh, you know, it means really that you don't have to stay in the same space. Now you can start moving, not just away from the sign, but now what are you trying to get to? You're trying to get to the motor that is making this conveyor belt work. So now we're at the motor, which is the time to ask, to do the second task, which is to ask, how is racism operating here? And I think it's this lever. So I'm gonna pull up on the lever, and the whole system starts shaking, and I've done it, I've done it, except racism is very fancy, and it reconfigures itself, and it keeps on going which talks about the importance of the third task of being actively anti-racism, which is to organize and strategize to act. So as I'm pulling on the lever, I need you to push a button, I need you to swing that pendulum, I need you to pull on that pulley, and all of us working together, I believe, can dismantle this system, maybe not in our lifetimes, but we need to keep at it, and maybe in one generation or two generations, but we can dismantle this system and put in its place a system in which all people can know and develop to their full potentials. That is the invitation that I offer to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.